Hi everyone, this is lesson four, um, animal organs and plant systems, and this is going to be the last lesson from me um, in this uh, unit of biology. Um, there are going to be other videos that I'm going to be releasing, instructional videos to help you understand your assignments, but in terms of covering course content, this is it. Um, so, uh, learning goals. Uh, for this lesson, you're going to be asked to describe what an organ is and how it fits into biological hierarchy. Uh, describe how tissues contribute to the function of an organ, and describe how root and shoot systems function in plants. Um, I want to say something more about this lesson um, quickly, and that's that this lesson is meant to be supplementary. Um, what I mean by that is that um, you will notice in your assignments that there are a lot of other videos um, that I'm giving you links to uh, that are um, elsewhere on the internet, crash course videos from YouTube and such things. Um, and uh, they're going to give you most of the information that you're going to need to complete your assignments in this unit, um, rather than videos that I'm making. Uh, but there might be a couple of things that are not in those videos that can help you to complete the assignments. And so that's what I'm trying to give you here. So um, the actual learning goals are not just covered only in my lesson. You're going to have to actually look at some of the YouTube video links that I post um, to fully complete these learning goals. Um, but this should hopefully help you bridge the gap between those videos and the assignment, the, the one or two things that you might be missing. Okay, so first learning goal, we're going to look at how organs fit into biological hierarchy. So if we can remember that concept, right, this idea that larger things are made up of the smaller things below them. So organisms are made up of organ systems, which are made up of organs and so on. And we've already seen this, right? We've seen all the organelles that make up a, a the various types of specialized cells that we have. Uh, we've seen that tissues are made up of cell types that are similar. Um, remember the, the sort of uh, the analogy that we had there with the arrows. Um, you know, it's hard to break a bundle of arrows where it's easy to break one arrow. So if you combine a whole bunch of cells together that are similar, they can carry out functions that one cell can't, right? They're more than the sum of their parts. You put a whole bunch of cells together, they can do some pretty amazing things. So now we're in this area here and we want to know how do tissues and organs relate on the hierarchy? How, how are organs made of tissues? Or what does that mean to say that? Well, let's look at an organ that we're hopefully all familiar with. So this is the stomach. Um, and uh, what I'm hoping to show you here is that the stomach's made of several different types of tissue. Um, in fact, you can see all four types of tissue here. So on the inside of the stomach, you've got epithelial uh, tissue, right? Tissue that lines and protects the stomach. Um, epithelial tissue also is capable of secreting or releasing uh, chemicals into this environment. So what do the various types of epithelial cells in your uh, stomach release? Some of them actually release the stomach acid uh, that's going to digest the food um, or at least activate enzymes that digest the food. Uh, but uh, some of the epithelial cells in here are going to release mucus that is going to protect uh, your stomach from burning itself up with that nasty acid. Uh, so you crucial jobs played in the stomach by this epithelial tissue in terms of lining to protect and secreting useful substances. You've also got muscle tissue in the stomach, right? So you've got different layers of muscle that you can see here. Um, I'm going to tell you in just a minute, but I want you to think about this. Let's see if you remember from last unit, uh, or rather yesterday. Uh, what type of muscle tissue do you think this would be? Would it be skeletal muscle tissue? Would it be smooth muscle tissue? Cardiac? I'll give you a second. So hopefully you're aware that this is smooth muscle tissue, right? This is not under our voluntary control. It doesn't connect to your bones. So you can't actually control when your stomach uh, moves. Um, and it's not cardiac tissue, which is specialized to the heart. So um, what this muscle is going to do is going to allow your stomach to kind of grind up the food, right? You might notice that a stomach, your stomach can actually kind of twist itself and um, to some extent to uh, physically grind up the food that's in there. Um, you've also got smooth muscle here in the pyloric sphincter and the, uh, here in the gastroesophageal sphincter. So you've got two sphincter muscles that control entry and exit of material into a stomach. Um, so that's what a sphincter is, right? It's a ring of smooth muscle um, that can open and close a, an opening. So other places in your body that you have sphincters, uh, we have sphincters uh, in the, the anus part of the body. Um, and something I didn't know uh, until I... Um, I don't remember when I learned this, but it was kind of weird. Um, you've got sphincter muscles in your eyes, right? Uh, your iris can expand and contract to um, narrow or widen your pupil. So sphincter muscles are also examples of smooth muscles. So what does a muscle do here? It can grind up the food and it can allow entry 
um, and exit of the food at the right time. Um, and we know that, in fact, because sometimes this doesn't work. Your gastroesophageal sphincter, for whatever reason, uh, might not open and close properly. And that can lead to what we call heartburn. Um, or what we might more formally call gastroesophageal reflux. Uh, so in other words, that's when the acid from the stomach, because this doesn't close properly, is able to uh, get into your esophagus and irritate it, um, which can be painful or just, just uncomfortable and make it hard for you to sleep if it happens at night. Uh, so, so yeah, so the sphincter is open and close. Uh, you've also got uh, connective tissue, which you can see under here. The submucosa is connective tissue that holds the stomach in place. It connects the top portion of the stomach to the lower portion of the stomach here. Um, and if the muscles are going to be contracting uh, to grind up the food, they need they need signals to do that, right? This is not cardiac muscle tissue. can't do it on its own. Uh, it needs signals from the brain. So you're also going to have nervous tissue in there that communicates those messages. So we've got all four types of tissue uh, working to create the stomach. All right, well, what about muscles themselves, though? Um, you've got uh, muscle, skeletal muscle tissue, which we're aware of, right? So we, we know skeletal muscle tissue is in a place like this. So is this just skeletal muscle tissue, or do we consider this to be some kind of organ? Um, so it turns out that muscles actually are organs, and you can kind of see that if you look at this um, in a bit of detail, uh, right? So yes, you do have smooth. Uh, sorry, you do have skeletal muscle tissue here, um, which is connected to these tendons, which are connective tissue. So you've already got connective tissue in here connecting your muscle to the bone. Um, if you actually look at the muscle uh, itself, where the skeletal muscle fibers are located, um, the outer portion uh, of the muscle is quite tough. It's connective tissue that holds it in place. Um, and you've also got a motor neuron here, right? Remember motor neuron, that's going to be a nervous tissue that's going to be sending information from your brain to um, allow you to move this muscle when you want to move it. So even muscles themselves, when you look at them as a whole, when you don't just look at the part that expands and contracts, uh, what you've got is uh, an organ, right? You've got multiple tissues working together to uh, carry out some kind of function. What about blood vessels, organs or tissues? Um, hopefully you're getting the idea, and if you actually just look at this and read these um, labels here, you might understand that blood vessels are organs, right? They have multiple tissue parts, multiple tissue types, rather, uh, contributing to how they function. So you've got epithelial tissue in the endothelium here that lines the um, artery and protects it. Uh, so um, below that you've got uh, muscle layers, which are important because they allow the artery to expand and contract. Um, which happens when your heart pumps, um, right? The uh, blood pressure in your body goes up and down depending on when your heart is pumping and when it's relaxed, right? When the ventricles contract and when the ventricles relax, you have higher and lower pressure, which is why uh, blood pressure is given to you usually as two numbers. Um, so the artery needs to accommodate that so the muscle tissue can expand and contract to do that. Um, in addition, there are blood vessels that will have smooth muscle that can contract to um, reduce the flow of blood uh, or expand to increase the flow of blood to parts of your body. Um, so, for example, we talked about already if you get cold, right, if you're outside um, and there is a danger that the cold could threaten your organs, uh, then what your body will do is it will reduce the blood flow to your extremities, to your hands, to your feet, um, and it will keep the blood in your core region of your body because that's where the important organs are. So they need to be kept warm so that they function. Um, so that would be an example where you see smooth muscle changing the amount of blood that flows through a vessel. Um, you've also got this thick wall of connective tissue on the outside of a muscle, uh, sorry, on the outside of a blood vessel, um, which holds its uh, shape. So, um, and then in order for the muscles to, um, close off or open up blood vessels, um, or at least narrow them or widen them, uh, you need nervous tissue to send those messages. So again, you've got the different tissue types working together here to perform a function. Um, and so you create an organ out of those tissue types. All right, um, another area I want to cover because it's not really covered in the other resources I've provided you with is um, uh, plant systems um, and plant organs, so to speak. So it's a little bit weird to think of 
something in a plant as an organ. Um, but you do have this sort of level of organization where you have multiple tissues coming together uh, to perform a function in a plant. Um, and if you remember those types of tissues, you've got this meristematic tissue that can divide and differentiate. Um, you've got ground tissue, which acts as like the filler and can do photosynthesis or storage. Uh, you've got dermal tissue, which can uh, protect the outside of surfaces. Um, and you've got vascular tissue, which can provide uh, the plant with the transport system, right, of water and sugar to various parts as it's needed, um, and other nutrients as well. Okay, so um, let's look at a leaf. And so you can think of a leaf as an organ because you do have the situation where you have multiple tissue types coming together to perform the function. So what is the main function of a leaf? Well, hopefully you're aware, right? A leaf has large surface area. It's very spread out. So it's like a solar panel. It's very effective at collecting sunlight. And this is where the plant will uh, do photosynthesis and produce its sugars. Um, so how is a leaf designed to carry that out? Um, well, if we're talking about the actual photosynthesis itself, we've got this palisade mesophyll. Um, underneath the main surface of the leaf. And so this palisade mesophyll is going to be carrying out most of the photosynthesis. They're packed really tightly together um, in order to capture as much light as possible. They have lots of chloroplasts. Um, and so this would be an example of ground tissue, right? This is tissue that is filling up the space inside the leaf. Um, you've also got spongy mesophyll underneath that layer that does something similar. So these, uh, this is also ground tissue that um, is able to catch whatever the top part missed. Uh, in terms of access to sunlight and can do photosynthesis as well. But there are spaces between the spongy mesophyll. They're not packed as tightly together. Why not? Um, well, remember uh, what you need to do photosynthesis, right? You need sunlight, um, but you also need carbon dioxide and water. So if you need carbon dioxide, how are you going to get carbon dioxide into a leaf? It's, it's a gas, right? Uh, so you need to have um, openings for that to happen, and you need to have spaces inside the leaf for the gases to uh, disperse, move around. So the spongy mesophyll layer is there to let gas through the leaf so that all of these cells have access to carbon dioxide for photosynthesis, and you have uh, cells below that, these stomata, um, which uh, stomata are the holes in the bottom of the leaf that can open and close um, by these other cells around them called guard cells, so they can uh, inflate and deflate um, and that causes the uh, opening to uh, close or open. Okay, so what you've got on the bottom here then is dermal tissue, um, which basically uh, lines the leaf and also allows air access or not access. So, so why would you have these stomata then? Why would, why would they be here? Why not just leave the leaf open all the time and let as much carbon dioxide in as possible? Um, well, that's the other equation in photosynthesis, the other aspect of that equation, right? You need carbon dioxide, you need sunlight, but you also need water. Uh, so stomata need to close to prevent water loss. Um, so there's going to have to be adjustments into when these stomata open and when these stomata close um, in order to maintain enough CO2, uh, carbon dioxide, in the leaf to do photosynthesis, but also to maintain enough water. You've got dermal tissue at the top, and like we said, dermal tissue... Um, layers and protects uh, plant surfaces, um, but we also said that it can create, sort of like epithelial tissue, it can create material um, on top of itself. And so the material that it creates on top of itself here is this waxy cuticle that prevents uh, water loss. Um, so you can already see dermal tissue, we've already seen uh, brown tissue, and here we have vascular tissue, right? So these cells are going to be producing um, they're going to be producing sugar, and so that sugar is going to need to move to other parts of the plant, right? Typically, if we have excess sugar, it's sent to the roots and stored there as a starch. So um, that sugar will need to get to the root by way of the vascular tissue. So you've got xylem and phloem here, which can carry things to and from the leaf. Um, so it can provide the leaf with the nutrients it needs um, and also take away what the leaf produces and spread it to the parts of the plant that need it. Um, so, right, so the leaf is a relatively complicated structure. Uh, you'll notice again that the stomata are on the bottom, they're not on the top, which kind of makes sense when you think about evaporation of water and where the sun's hitting it. Uh, so the structure of a leaf is fairly complex and it's built up of many types of tissues, so you can think of it as an organ. You can also think of a flower uh, as a, an organ, as a reproductive organ in a plant. Um, I'm not going to get into this in too much detail. 
um, but uh, you have male and female parts on some flowers. So we call those flowers perfect flowers if they have both male and female parts. Um, some flowers have only male parts and some flowers have only female parts. Um, this one has both. So the so-called female part of the plant. Um, and just to be clear here, we use the words male and female because they're kind of analogous to the way sexual reproduction happens in animals, but it's not really the same. Um, sexual reproduction, it, like we said, in bio biology is messy. Um, so sexual reproduction has evolved, if you like, uh, more than one time. Um, and it, you can kind of see that because this is not really the way it happens in, in animals. Like, yes, you're mixing, um, half DNA from one partner, half DNA from the other, but it's a very different process. And, and so, um, yes, we call this male and yes, we call this female, but it's not the way that we would use those words in humans. And as we're starting to realize now anyways, right, male and female in humans is, overly simplistic, right? There's um, more to um, sex and gender in humans than just male and female. So yeah, biology is messy, right? Um, things don't fit into neat categories most of the time. Uh, in any case, uh, this is the female part of the plant here. So we call the uh, top here the stigma and the tube that leads up to it is the style. So uh, what has to happen is the male um, portion of the plant containing the sperm has to actually um, get on top of here. And so the sperm is typically held in pollen, um, which is carried uh, in the anthers, uh, which we see here. Uh, so you have an anther on the top and a filament holding it up. So you might have wind or some kind of pollinator like a bee or some other insect take pollen from the anther, um, spread it around, and it will hit the stigma um, of a flower, typically another flower as well, because you'll notice that the stigma is higher uh, than the anthers, and, and often that is true, um, and we think that's because um, that prevents or at least minimizes the chances of self-pollination um, in a plant because um, the whole point of sexual reproduction is to have genetic diversity, to mix and match genes, um, and so if a plant just fertilizes itself, it's not really doing that, um, and so it doesn't get the, the benefits associated with sexual reproduction. Um, so in any case, the, um, the stigma, the pollen will go onto the stigma, and it contains enzymes that will allow it to create a tube. So it will actually create a tube that carries the sperm cells with it down into this region here. Um, so within the ovary, which is this whole thing, you've got the ovule. And that's where the uh, egg cells, so to speak, are kept. Again, don't think of egg in the plant as egg in a human or egg in a chicken or something like that. These very different. Same, same kind of idea in that you're combining one half and another half, but the structures are very different. So anyways, the sperm fertilizes the egg, and then what happens then is you have uh, produced um, a, uh, well, a new embryo that could grow into another plant. Uh, so you'll get seeds, um, and those seeds will then uh, sit within this ovary, which swells, it grows larger and larger, and becomes a fruit. Um, so yeah, this, this part here is actually like a proto-fruit. This is going to become a fruit uh, if the... Um, flower is, uh, if the egg here is fertilized. And you can see this happening in this video. It's only 28 seconds if you're interested. It's, it's kind of cool if you haven't seen it before, but, but yeah, believe it or not, fruit comes out of a flower here. Okay. Um, last thing to really mention here is that just like you have organs, uh, in, um, animals, uh, you go up a level and you get organ systems. So I'm not going to say much about organ systems um, because I've given you a whole bunch of information on that in the videos uh, about uh, animals. Um, and I'm not going to say too much about organ systems here either because I've got another couple of videos that I've found here that you can use. Um, there are a couple of questions on your assignment that ask you to um, compare and contrast with plants. So I highly recommend that you watch these videos to help you do that. Um, and the last thing I'll mention here, just out of interest, if anyone knows what this plant is, you should know what this plant is. Like this, if you don't know what this plant is, you could actually suffer. Um, so this is what we call giant hogweed. Um, it exists in peel, um, so you may encounter it in parks. Usually there are signs up that warn people about it. Um, there's a reason why this person is dressed like this. If you actually contact this plant, it's got a toxin on it. Um, that uh, destroys the um, parts of your skin that protect you from the sun. 
um, which maybe doesn't sound so bad, except that um, if you have no protection from the sun in that region of your skin, you will get a very, very nasty sunburn. And it, it's not like just, you know, sitting out in the sun for too long. Um, it will burn and it can burn badly. And if it gets in your eyes, um, maybe potentially it could blind you. So, so yeah, be, be careful about this particular shoot system. Avoid the shoot system of giant hogweed um, if you see it. All right, that's it. Thank you.